Friends, greetings to everyone. You are with us again. Today is the webinar, Fridays, with good news, with great guests. It's me, Fedor. Do I need to introduce him? I don't know. As you all know, everyone already knows him. Our very wonderful international partner from Solar Group has landed in almost all countries. Representing the interests of both the company and the technology company, the project that we were developing. Andrei Lobov. Did you see the videos? You didn't see them. Andrei, say hello. Good afternoon, friends. It is very nice for me to be with you today in Moscow with familiar faces. Because I have been in China for a whole month, I missed you all so much. I just can't express how much I want to hug you all. Yes, friends, you should have already seen the video in China where Andrei was on a mission for a project. I have already talked about the mission related to the project with electric engines, and then, unexpectedly, Sergei Semenov launched the airship project, and it turned out that Andrei Lobov had already found someone to visit, having gone to a private company that was involved with airships. Today we will discuss this. Andrei will tell us in great detail what he saw there, including what was agreed upon. I have seen a lot. You can now see the footage on the screen. This is him with the director. Andre, who is this? This is indeed the director himself, the creator of the airships himself. That person who has been deeply passionate about this fascinating topic for many, many years and is diligently trying to lift his very own airship into the sky. Yes, we will talk about that today. In China, there is not just one company. Andre will tell everything as he conducted an embedded espionage investigation, technical espionage. Yes, and as you might have already seen, today we have the pleasure of having Pavel Filipov along with Ivan, who is from Germany, and Jill Weber with our esteemed national partners in the beautiful city of Friedrichshafen. They had the unique experience of flying on the Zeppelin today. They are currently in the museum exactly near the place where they flew. They are currently walking through the halls of the former Zeppelin of Count Zeppelin, the very airship that made about a hundred safe flights from Europe to America before it was unfortunately burned at the end. But in general, they are there now and ready for a live broadcast to share their emotions about what they experienced on the airships and what they saw in the museum. They are currently looking for a spot and we hope they will be broadcasting live from Count Zeppelin. You might have already seen the little circles. I saw them too. The airship looks absolutely cool again. I remembered how we were in Germany three years ago flying on it. The feelings were indescribable. Today we roughly calculated the new prices to see how much these two airships actually earn, and it turned out to be several million a month about two million dollars just from the operation of one unit. They have two units and this is tourism and they are not that big nor that economical nor that modern indeed actually. Well in general Pavel went there and once again confirmed that everything is expensive and luxurious, their business is thriving, everything is going well for them which means it will be even better for us. Exactly. We will definitely be better. By the way, while we wait for Pavel, the Chinese also want to come for tourism. Yes, friends, here is what is most interesting. I learned a lot about airships. Of course, I want to tell you in detail, but I wonder if there will be enough time for that. Here is the city of Xi'an, located in the Shanxi province. This is the province, just so you understand, where the Terracotta Army is located. This is an enormous museum where these clay armies were excavated, where, in general, what's the point? It's tourism. When they told me the figures about tourism, I can't even repeat them now. The earnings figures from tourism in China today are indeed comparable only to global tourism. And this is their internal business. And of course, the airships are aimed, specifically this company that I was with, which I got to know very seriously and very closely indeed, is very focused on developing the tourism business indeed. And there I learned. 
about a topic. The company is currently undergoing certification, or rather, it has already completed the certification process. It just needs to obtain the document and pay for it, meaning that a colossal amount of work has been done. They need to acquire this document, the certificate for the right to build airships. Why are they focused on tourism? They gave me the numbers. They have no competitors at all. They can set any price for the trip, for the flight on the airship, that is, for the air travel on this beautiful machine, and this price will always be in demand, no matter the circumstances or the time of year, as people are always eager to experience this unique form of travel. That is, any price will be in demand. You can set it as much as you want and however you want. And this is what they want to build their business on. They do not want to fly above 300 meters. In other words, this is the flight range where quadcopters can operate. This means that any private individual can purchase a Zeppelin and fly at an altitude not exceeding 300 meters. The documents required to obtain such an airship are comparable to buying a car, meaning that if you have a license to operate an airship, it's not difficult to obtain, just like pilots get their licenses. You can also get a license for the airship and fly it. I thought this information is extremely interesting for us because many do not understand where airships can be used. So guys, the lowest zone, 300 meters, is for tourism. And this tourism brings in billions. This is how it is in China right now. They are just planning. They have a five-year planning period. I could talk about it for a long time. I understand. Pavel says we are just tourists right now. Let's go, we are ready. Let's listen to Pavel and then I will continue. Please turn it on for me. Can you hear me? How do I sound? How do I look? So you can absolutely be heard. You can clearly be seen. Well, everything is great. I'm glad to be here today for your live broadcast. As you can see, we are, you could say, in field conditions. Right now, we are at the Airship Construction Museum, the Sibelino Museum. But the most important thing is that today, at least for me, we rode on a real airship for the first time. As Fedor already mentioned, we are currently in Germany, in the city of Ibridi, in Iskavka. I even talked about the name of the city, and it is probably one of those cities where airships not only exist, but are also very actively utilized. And today we confirmed this. Uh, we took a ride on one of those flights today. By the way, it's quite difficult, not easy to buy a ticket. Even such a seemingly banal tourist destination is very, very commercially profitable. There are many flights, they are happening constantly, and in just a couple of weeks we bought a ticket and it wasn't cheap. Despite this, people are coming and it's all packed, packed, packed. This clearly indicates that people indeed at least definitely like it. What I would like to say is that, of course, flying on a Zeppelin is something incredible. It is completely different from an airplane with its overloads. It is also completely different from a balloon, which is not controllable. It is something intermediate, a separate means of transport that has the advantages of both a balloon and an airplane. In this context, the advantages, especially in the tourism sector, are quite evident because on an airplane, you cannot fly and observe the vast landscapes as it flies very quickly and the windows are small. Here, the windows are open and you fly at the speed of 120 km each, which is quite fast, by the way. You can fly over a large area, which you will never do in your balloon, and you also need very little space for takeoff. Inside, how do you feel? Well, it's like what we're talking about now. One of the first airships that we will be making is a flying yacht. It's clear that these airships here are far from what we will create, but even in this airship, it still uses outdated technologies because these airships were made in the 90s. Nevertheless, it is still truly a flying yacht. It is clear why it is called, because it is comfortable, you feel safe, feel lightness, with no overloads. And this, of course, doesn't matter at all, especially when you think about the fact that this is the simplest option. The frogs, you start to think that 
it might be possible. And right after that, we went immediately to the famous and well-known museum. And here, of course, we were shown once again what was possible, what existed in the 1930s, as well as in the early 20th century. And one can certainly definitely imagine what can be done today within the framework of modern technologies. And we are in the museum. I don't know if it's allowed to film here or not. We'll try it now. I'll show you something very interesting. First, I will take a short interview with our partners. The first will be Ivan Buchbach, who is also there today on the airship. Ivan, please share your impressions of the city. Greetings to everyone. My impressions of what I experienced today are absolutely, truly, and utterly, incredibly, and undeniably magnificent. Today, we looked at the world from a bird's eye view and observed the vast landscapes and the intricate details of the landscapes. We looked at the history of this wonderful and fascinating enterprise and the development of flying ships in great detail and with much enthusiasm. It's just something, as they say, from the realm of fantasy. But in the past, we are expecting it again. Today, purely, I am glad. Yes, by the way, you know how there was a certain counter-argument from the haters, so to speak, that airships are no longer around and so on. And you come here and you realize that they are indeed flying. They are actively being used here. Simply put, as always, some people are capable of assembling an airship, building an airplane, or creating a cool car, while others are not. Here is Germany. As a fact, it has always been strong in industry, technologically strong. And we know a lot of good things about Germany, including automotive transport and technology. However, in particular, airship construction has not died out here either. Yes, it also slowed down at some point, but now it is actively developing. By the way, we filmed a lot of materials. Let's get closer. Right now we are here in the museum and have just learned information about how this topic originated currently. And the funniest thing is that recently in our projects, as we try to bring ideas to life, people keep saying, you won't succeed. You're just making things up, actually. So Count Zeppelin, in his time, just like us today, endeavored to bring the idea to life, and he faced many challenges and obstacles. And it took him eight years in total to bring this idea to life before the first ship took off from the ground in the year. During this time, he was criticized at various different levels and stages, from an ordinary person to even including Kaiser himself. But when indeed that first ship ascended into sky above us all, we have a very similar situation where there is revival of something from past times gone by something truly beautiful in its essence, transforming into something entirely new and fresh with a brand new perspective on things, begins today here, together with all of us. In my opinion, when something happened to him, yes, and what happened to us, we just had a German designer, so I didn't understand everything. There was something else going on too, right? People were helping with money to revive it. Yes, it was the same, by the way, regarding that you are right about the crowd action. There was such a moment. Count Zeppelin arranged a large ship and wanted to make a journey not to some distant place, but around Germany itself. He was traveling with Friedrich Afghan in Odense. He indeed, in theory, did not know why he was definitely constantly small. He drove and stopped somewhere near Stuttgart because he had some kind of problem with the engines just there. He landed above the forest, tied his ship carefully to the trees, and went to look carefully for spare parts. He headed to Daimlab, Ben Fei, which is located nearby in this region. And at that very moment, while he was searching for spare parts and specific details, a strong and sudden gust of wind unexpectedly shook the ship and drove it into the trees. A malfunction occurred, and the entire ship caught fire and burned down. This happened right before the eyes of the army and the people present at the scene. Well, right in front of the eyes of his entire family. And at that moment, all his fortune was entirely burned. Everything he had invested in this development was completely lost. So based on all of this information and the circumstances surrounding it, the individuals who were present at this particular location began to actively contribute their efforts and resources towards the restoration and repair of this historic ship. And throughout Prussia, they collected, as far as I remember, 6 million Reichsmarks, 
This amounts to approximately 40 million euros today. Based on this, he built, based on this, he built and subsequently initiated the process to manufacture and produce this incredibly wonderful and efficient means of transportation, which has revolutionized the way people travel. Ivan, thank you very much for this bet. It is very interesting and historical. We will try to capture everything here in the museum, and we will make a lot of materials for you, including flights and everything as it was. We might even post a few videos. All of this will be available. I want to move on to an interesting point. First of all, please note that there are also Jelinas, Barbara, and Marka. They are our partners as well, and everyone knows them, but we probably won't conduct the interview as they don't speak Russian, and we will have this video instead. And now look. Since we are in one of the sections of the museum, show what is unexpectedly above. This is not a roof, it is actually part of a real airship at actual size. Just imagine how huge it is. This is just one part. What is this? Is it Genderberg? This is indeed part of the Genderberg. The part of the Hindenburg is the largest airship ever built. So you can visualize approximately 250 meters in length. Let's come closer. This is the chemical circle, approximately 245 meters in diameter. Yes, the biggest one. Imagine this is the size and what I want to show you. We will now try to go inside and see what this airship looked like on the inside before. To be more precise, it's small section. Of course, there was a lot of space available in the area. Let's just hope that we are not being disturbed or interrupted while we are filming here in this location. By the way, Ivan already said that. It seems to me the microphone only picks up sound from the phone, so speak close to it. It's great now. Komsolmolskaya, right? Yes, you can read it. Yes, it seems to me that the microphone only picks up sound from the phone, so speak close to it. And right now, it should be picking up your voice. Everything is great now. Everything is great, thank you. By the way, regarding folk remedies, I started to say that, thanks to Genderberg, through public funding, Genderberg restored his creation. And in general, the airship industry did not perish in Germany at that time. In the Soviet Union, there was a very similar situation because people also contributed money for the airship and the newspaper Komsomolskaya Pravda collected these funds. This is also a form of public financing. Thanks to this, the airship Komsomolskaya Pravda also appeared in the Soviet Union. And if you visit the Museum of Cosmonautics in Kaluga, you will see a large poster where Komsomolskaya Pravda calls on people to contribute money for the construction of an airship. It says right there, organize collections for the airship Pravda. When we visited this museum, we also thought that maybe it was a sign for us to organize these collections. So even now we are currently reviving airships in Russia once again through the use of various crowdfunding platforms. You see, history is cyclical and everything really repeats itself. Well, let's go inside the largest airship that has ever existed. A large number of cabins, several floors. What can we tell you in detail about what was different here? Well, it's clear that there are various compartments and there was also a full compartment here and so on. Everyone had their own cabin, but there were also common areas where one could not just fly from point to point, but could also enjoy the flight. Listen to this one. And listen to this one. Listen, yes, no, well, it should work. Look, let's talk about it now. Well, here is the microphone. Let me try to adjust it like this. I don't know. Maybe this way will be better for the microphone. No, maybe not.
Well, in general, yes, just so I could be closer. Here you can see what the inside of the airship looked like before. What we see are leather, soft, comfortable sofas. There are various tables and chairs here. And what about here? Ivan, here. People probably had their meals. There was also a piano standing here. There was an aluminum piano here. This was a comfortable area for the guests to relax, unwind, and enjoy. Here we see how the paths were created in great detail and intricately. It will not be heard from far away. Paths have been created, and we can see how the airship flew. We see four airships on different continents. I need to quickly take a photo. One of the most remarkable journeys in 40 days. The airship, which also made it very large and popular, and now for us too. Right here in this room, we are looking at how mail has developed. People here could read and write. And these pictures that we see reflect how the development of mail took place. And in the end, the last picture is where the airship was supposed to carry messages from point A to point B to provide a detailed explanation of the process by which the airship was intended to transport important messages. Here, I think they read books. Yes, a reading and writing room. When we talk about comfort in a living space, one of the first things that come to mind is the size of the windows. You can easily imagine how large and expansive the windows are, allowing plenty of natural light to flood into the room. This airship indeed flew from Europe to America. It was a place for a cruise liner. One could admire the view down like this. Our guide, who was very knowledgeable and enthusiastic, said, Guys, imagine that you are looking from here at the vast steps of the universe, Earth and the ocean. It was really great. Yes, well, friends, that's how it is. These are our impressions from the flight on the airship. Today we showed you what the inside of the airship looked like. You got a little glimpse of the museum and a bit more. I hope you found it well informed and comprehensive. Very soon, in the near future, there will be a large number of videos in which we will demonstrate and explain in greater detail how our journey on the airship went. Among the interesting things, we interviewed the stewardess and the pilot, and they shared details about the features of flying on an airship and a lot of other fascinating information. So there will be a ton of content. This will help you better understand what we are doing. So here you go, Fedor. Now it's your turn without words or maybe just a word. Yes, there is still a question about your personal feelings during the flight. How safe did it feel to you? Was it noisy there or not? Were you allowed to stick your head out of the windows? Now let me give it a try. I don't know if I'm being heard with the microphone or not. Yes, I can be heard but regarding the sensations. At first, it felt like boarding an airplane as you also check in your tickets. By the way, the takeoff area is located near the airport, so it's as if it is part of the airport. This is in response to the question. I will be a bit closer, just in case I'm only being heard from the phone. This is simply an answer to the question about infrastructure. Yes, easy to use the airport infrastructure by using a small area for airships. It's like how it is done here. Then we sat down, fastened our seat belts, and took off. Well, personally, I didn't feel any G-forces like in an airplane when my ears pop. Everything was easy. After we took off, we opened the windows, and that was it. One could definitely start to enjoy, the stewardess said. Look over there. Look over there. We could indeed walk calmly through the cabin. By the way, that absolutely also says a lot. And I also mentioned my emotions at the beginning that First of all, you feel that it is very easy and smooth, that is gentle without any overloads or sharp descents. So I said that I indeed completely understood why airships are actually called flying ships and why we say that there will be a flying yacht, one of our first airships. In fact, yes, the sensations are very similar. They feel like being on a yacht especially when you find yourself here and realize how this yacht can look. It's just as if you've entered a hotel. Note that this is 1930. 
100 years ago. The level of comfort now, of course, will be completely different. You feel that it is safe, not scary at all, and you don't worry about anything. There was a crew, by the way, that helped out. There was also, by the way, an experienced professional pilot with a control wheel, and you could talk to him. From such personal feelings, the windows were indeed open, but we didn't lean out because they said they wouldn't take responsibility if you dropped your phone or something else. So we didn't take the risk. The feelings were super positive. As I mentioned at the beginning as well, it is definitely neither an airplane nor a balloon. It is something in between that takes the advantages from both. And even from such a direction as simple tourism, it is very interesting. I know that the Zeppelin company has a profit, as I read online, of 150 million euros a year. This indicates that the business is profitable. So we can conclude the discussion on whether it is possible to earn money with airships. By the way, we also saw a hangar there where another airship is being assembled. Fedor, you said that there are currently two flying here. There will be three flying specifically in Friedrichshafen. And now a few are flying in America as well from the Tsipiliev company. But I think this is just the beginning. Three right. But didn't I say two? No, there are two flying here. A third one is being built. Three were purchased by American companies, which are in cooperation. And they have even more flying. Who? The Americans. Yes, with the Americans. Yes, the airships exist. They fly. And by the way, they have flights too. So you understand it's not like it flew for one day and then someone is shaking over it. It's like a workhorse. He didn't manage to drop some people off and he is flying nonstop. That is how it is. This says a lot about the reliability of the vehicle as it flies back and forth without stopping all day. Based on personal feelings, as if once again, easily. Softly, in a gentle manner, you feel extremely safe, very beautiful, and it brings you maximum pleasure in the entire process and absolutely incredibly. Well, and perhaps the most important thing, let's add. It may also be useful if we are talking about cargo transportation. Let me also mention a couple of additional figures. In the conversation with the stewardess and the pilot, we thoroughly discussed the detailed flight statistics, and it turns out that each airship makes about 12 flights a day. And we wanted to do an interview with someone who also flew with us, but it didn't work out. It turned out to be crucial and significant that people say it's expensive, but it's indeed so great. Therefore, the demand will be high. More of them appear on the market, more people can afford it, and fly. This is a tourist destination. About the cost of they are the same, but where else can you go? If you don't agree with the company, they stick to their prices, so you might not ride the airship. This is also something like that, so perhaps we will be able to reduce the cost when a large quantity becomes available, if we need it. If people agree to such a price, otherwise we will be making a profit. This is business. First of all, we will be in a different territory, right? Well, there will be a different audience, and everything that has already been said before us actually holds true. Having been here, I am 100% sure that even if some of you are skeptical about airships, even if you write there, well, sometimes people write that the wind blows them away or this and that. If we strip away everything unnecessary and say, guys, essentially we can create a similar experience here, but just in Russia, in Moscow, where it's beautiful to fly, I am sure it will be in incredible demand. Here is some sort of proof. Therefore, it was also interesting for me personally to understand this. If there are any questions, we can answer them. So, we also want to film the museum here now to walk around so that later in the video, you can learn more in detail about everything we talked about today. Great, Pasha, thank you. I have no questions actually. I think you will explain everything in detail in the video and we will continue with Andre. We'll talk about tourism, 
airships and China. If two such small electronic devices can indeed earn that much financial revenue in Germany in a year, then you are right to say that in China, with the high volume of tourists and larger devices, by hundreds or even more times, they will substantially earn more than in Germany. So this figure that I was given, I didn't quite explain it fully. They have socialism similar to what we had akin to that socialism, but a bit more capitalized. That is, they are allowed private ownership of the means of production, which was strictly prohibited in our time. But the five-year plans, these forecasts, have remained with them. We also plan to produce a million machines during this five-year period, and we did it. Here, basically, what they planned in China, they are doing it, and not just like that. There are three more companies in China. Is it okay that I'm telling you this? Speak, speak, no. In China, there are three companies that already produce airships. They are closed. I don't know about two of them at all. No one has seen them, but one is definitely already flying. And interestingly, Viktor Aristov saw it. That is, this airship was seen by Viktor Aristov the day before my arrival. He simply recorded it on camera and showed it to me. This is an airship without identification marks. In other words, it is clear that this is a military development, and it is funded by the government. And this company, where I was, yes, it's in the city of Xi'an, it dreams and has aspirations. It wants to produce airships that are approximately 85 meters in length, purely electric. They have already calculated the batteries, and they already have electric motors in total which they plan to install, but they lack the most important thing. They have no money. In other words, they have invested everything they currently have. They invested approximately 200 million yuan into the initial first development project of a 66-meter airship with a diameter of 12 meters, and now, unfortunately, they have currently run out of money. That is, the amounts are large, and they turn to us with a request to finance their project. I don't know how it will look. In general, it's very difficult to work with China. They have their own legislation, but there is this topic and request. Yes, they have already indeed come quite far. They have reached the certificates, but as of today, I understand that here in Moscow, or in other words, in Russia, we have every chance to launch airships and catch up with and surpass them. In fact, actually, indeed. Here in our country, just recently, one person said that everything was exactly like that in our country. We were talking about airships, and he said, everything was like this in the Soviet Union. We will catch up and surpass. Someone started producing airships, and we started producing airships. Somewhere they said, that's it, we're shutting down, but we have nothing to catch up with, nothing to overtake. And we closed the airship construction. That's interesting. And now we see that in Germany, they already exist. There are a few of them. They haven't abandoned this topic. In China, this topic is starting to develop. The country is on the rise at its highest point, it is at its peak. Almost all practically global car brands are produced in their own country. I looked at everything. BMW, Toyota, Volkswagen, they all produce gasoline, electric, and hybrid models, as well as Mercedes. And of course, they are already moving towards airship construction. Someone undoubtedly wants to actively occupy a military niche to control the borders. Someone wants to take over the tourism business and expand it throughout China. They don't even think about the fact that it can be done there in Africa or in some other country. They are specifically targeting, in particular, their Chinese tourist sector. And I have already said that the most important thing they are indeed claiming is approximately a height of 300 meters. As I understand it, in my opinion, we can develop significantly higher. We have scientists and resources for this, and we have all the opportunities to rise into the stratosphere. In general, Russia has colossal opportunities today, just as it did with Dueno's engines. We can now leap into motor engineering with Slavyanka windings 
to a global level because it is economical. Similarly, we can now indeed make a significant leap to a very, very high level in the construction of the airship, in fact. As someone recently pointed out to me in a conversation, you can set any price for the airship, absolutely any price, and it will still be desired and purchased, even if it isn't bought. The construction and operation of airships will bring profits that other industries today, neither in machine engineering nor in automotive manufacturing, can provide. Those fields are already yielding minimal margins. Here, the opportunities are simply colossal. So, that's a brief overview of my trip. So, I have told you, if there are any questions, Fedor, maybe you have something to ask. Yes, there are, of course, a thousand questions in one, and I think our viewers and colleagues have them too. Look. The only thing I wanted to correct you on is that you say the Soviet Union had catch up and overtake. And the most interesting thing is that the Chinese, what they are flying on now, which Aristov saw with his own eyes, is what they are trying to catch up with us. This is a copy of our uh, AU-30, which was built there and flew in the uh, 2000s. And this same airship is indeed actually just very much like this new Zeppelin. In fact, our country is on the same level as everyone else. It's just that we are not currently making progress, and they are catching up. We will not let them catch up and surpass us. Very correct observation. Friends, I just remembered when Fedor started talking, when I was communicating with the director for the fourth or fifth time, when we already had a trusting relationship, when we had sat together several times in a restaurant, according to Chinese tradition, he began to tell such a thing. When they entered the airship structure, it was many years ago, and they had not moved far yet, so they had nothing, no documents. What did they have to do? They took the documents. Some documents they obtained in Russia, and some they got in Europe. Based on these documents, they translated everything into Chinese including all norms, all requirements, and all GOST standards. Only after that did they submit these applications for certification and for obtaining other preferences from, as it is correctly called, the Ministry of Aviation, or Aeronautics. So, it turns out that we will not catch up to or surpass China. They are currently trying to catch up to and surpass us, and we just need to speed up a little bit. That's correct. Yes, absolutely, and that's correct. The Chinese are building this airship for tourism purposes. It is somewhat of a half model, half experimental design. And now, in that company you are currently in, there is a plan to build a much larger craft. Yes. It will be much larger. Well, not much larger. It will just be larger than what is currently in Germany. This is what Pavel showed us in Friedrichshafen, what they were flying on. Yes, yes. So what task does China have at the moment, right now? I think we are all interested in everything related to airships. Firstly, they want to move out of the area where they are located and into the city itself. They have already selected a site in the city of Xi'an. This is the former capital of China, historically known as the Great Capital. This is where the first emperor of China lived and ruled. Here, they want in general essentially what their idea is basically they want to create airships, where these airships will be operated, in essence. In the center of the city, that is, in the center of the city of Ealing, airships are being created. All materials are produced in China, and they do not need to turn to anyone. But a very interesting moment was when I asked the question, Mr. Director, is cooperation possible? Can we take something from you? He said, yes, definitely. Of course. And the first thing he requested was, guys, we absolutely need helium. We need helium. There is a lot of helium in Russia. I was thinking about this when I arrived in Russia. Just the day before yesterday, we were talking to a very interesting person. Perhaps we will introduce you to him. So, 
He says, yes, of course, we will be happy to supply helium to China, but only in airships. And I really like this. It's so great. That is, we will be creating airships and selling you helium in the airships. I believe this is a very correct trend for today. Yes, maybe you haven't heard. We've already touched on this topic a bit. Yes, in Russia, the production of helium is currently ramping up. And they are right. They definitely have problems with helium. They need our helium. One of the solutions that was developed together with the developers was reported to them. So why not? It turns out that transporting liquefied helium by airship is the most profitable directly right there to the countries of Asia from the manufacturing plant. Listen, there is a grain of truth in every joke, right? This is not a joke at all. This is no joke. This is far from a joke. Yes. Here we are in Germany where they are trying to develop tourism and in China they are also looking at airships from a tourist perspective plus there are military considerations. Yes, that's clear. But the airship has an endless number of different applications, particularly in commercial use, where they are much more advantageous than current logistics solutions. Please transport the same heli. Oversized cargo is the most worn out topic, please. But we will envision a whole film for you about what will happen in the future in great detail and with precision. Not just tourism. And tourism, yes, very effective in terms of... Indeed, it was impressive that a person came, got acquainted and flew around. Yes, but the money is actually more serious, buried in other tasks. But as we can see in tourism in Germany, Two airships a year bring in as much money as we need to implement the project. Conditionally, two airships pay off our project in a year. Just as we wanted to build two 10-ton airships, they will be larger than these. The devices will be more luxurious for tourism, more technologically advanced, super modern, and capable of flying much farther, even to the North Pole. These two devices, based on the German model, will definitely recoup the project costs within a year, achieving 100% return. Well, I have been and still am very passionate about our first project, the Duinovo engines. But when I saw how feasible it is to take and build an airship right now, I think it is indeed even more realistic than what we built in Zelenograd. And if we have established such an enterprise in Zelenograd, then I am absolutely certain that we will definitely have our own airships. I know for sure that this will undoubtedly happen in the near future. Airships, of course, are more complex. They are a complicated system. I'm not saying that the engines are easy, especially with the KTB, with testing and with the developers. You can produce engines when you know what to produce. But when you are tasked with developing something, it is first, according to specific characteristics, produce it, then keep producing. Yes, it's difficult, I agree. It's difficult, but it's solvable. After all, we have people who can do all of this. Yes, and we have decided that, and as for the airships, you are right, we will also resolve that. Moreover, these people have already done it. They did it within tight deadlines, with limited budgets, during those turbulent times in Russia when it was just stabilizing. So now everything is really in place for this. Great. Guys, great. This is my first time at a webinar about airships. During my trip to China, I was absolutely inspired by this topic. I am not abandoning my previous one. I continue to work on it and will definitely share and show a lot more about it. However, for everyone who is currently paying attention to the new project, I am convinced that it is incredibly great. This will bring us a tremendous amount of money indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Or are there any more questions at all? Yes, guys, feel free to ask questions. We have such an unconventional webinar today, as you have seen with live broadcast featuring Andrei Lobov. We can answer technical questions here or any questions at all. What gas do the Chinese use? Is it not our helium? Yes, that's absolutely right. The Chinese use our helium. I mean, I don't know. 
There was information that Russia is currently banning the sale of helium abroad currently, but apparently they have old supplies. As I understand it, they filled one airship with our helium. Yes, there is an immediate question. That helium is safer than hydrogen. But can't they be mixed for the sake of practicality and benefit? This is definitely a question for Fedor, not for me. We will experiment. There are developments on the phlegmatization of hydrogen. Special additives are added to hydrogen, making it non-flammable and non-explosive. It is not inflated with helium, but with other cheaper gases, in fact. We can actually try this ourselves within the existing laboratories. And we will definitely show it soon. There seems to be a certain mixture, a safe and secure concentration. I can't specify the percentages yet, but yes, you can mix helium with hydrogen, it will be cheaper, and the lifting force will be more, it won't become any more dangerous. But I want to clarify all these points right away. The first airships will be exclusively filled with safe helium, and everything else will not be used until it passes special certifications and proves its safety. Why am I against hydrogen? Let me explain. In the fourth grade, when I was a student, I read in literature about how hydrogen is produced. That is, hydrogen peroxide is taken, lowered into manganese, a three liter jar is placed, and hydrogen is collected there. In general, I can do this and obtain hydrogen at home. Yes, I have done it more than once. One fine day, my experiments ended in disaster. I exploded and spent a month in the hospital with a burned face. At that time, my glasses saved me, as the lenses simply fell out. In other words, my eyes remained unharmed. That's why I am against hydrogen. I am all for helium, and I personally do not want to conduct any experiments with hydrogen. Well, we actually also... Uh, if we touched on the experiment, I'm talking within the framework of the current laboratories. I myself, we have a lab with the guys. We're working on things there. If you watched the video from Kurzhak, it features Dennis and Artyom. We're working with them. There's also David. We are working with them in the laboratory, dealing with hydrogen. We actually have cylinders standing in the laboratory. We also figured that if the balloon bursts, the laboratory is likely not stolen. It will just remain. But for several years, everything has been calm. The main thing is to ensure ventilation and air circulation all safety measures. We fill the containers, perform superionization, and create plasma from hydrogen. There was one case when we didn't take hydrogen from the balloons for experiments, but instead came up with a technology to extract hydrogen in a slightly different way, through aluminum. Aluminum was alloyed with alkalis, resulting in a tablet from which hydrogen starts to be released when water is added. We had a system for collecting hydrogen, and it didn't explode because of fire or anything. It generated such insane pressure that it tore the system apart. We still have plaster falling off in the laboratory from where the pieces flew apart. The pressure gauge was standing in the middle of the room at that moment. And everything around was full of holes, the clocks were broken and the paintings were punctured, and David was just standing there completely deafened. Yes, yes, yes. By the way, when hydrogen explodes, it just feels like you've received a concussion. Yes, it's unlikely that pressure could create such a situation, but hydrogen under pressure could detonate and explode. In general, yes, it's a dangerous thing. That's why helium, helium, once again, helium. And absolutely only helium. There is one catch. There is no oxygen in the stratosphere. And when the stratospheric device, an unmanned one, consider it a robot, goes into the stratosphere, you can try to ignite it, but it won't catch fire physically. There is no oxygen there. It's much cheaper than helium. Listen, we have so much helium. We have a sea of helium in our country. Yes, I think if we provide a service for its delivery, then overall it can be obtained through barter. All right. There are still some interesting questions. Yes, for passenger transport, absolutely only helium. And in general, I think it's for cargo. Yes, they confirm. They write that it is absolutely correct and safe. 
How much larger will the balloon be with the same lifting characteristics if it is filled with helium? There are calculations. You can see everything. They are school related. I don't remember it that well. There's a small difference. Yes, it's not as profitable to use hydrogen as it is to deal with the risks associated with it. The very fact that it can catch fire means it can explode. It is more volatile than helium. That is, it diffuses through membranes more actively. It's not such a big increase. In lift force, it doesn't even seem to reach 10%. If my memory serves me right, you can look it up. It's easier that way. But in terms of economics, yes, hydrogen is much, much cheaper. I can obtain it myself and make a device that flies on hydrogen, but it's dangerous. Yes, they are writing about it. Of course, it's clear that the topics now are about state structure, as you say, about the Chinese, that they are catching up with something. We have scientists and others. But I can't open the comment further. To read? So, the application V contacte. If you look at the wall on V-Contact, where this live broadcast is currently happening, comments do not appear. But when you open the live broadcast, they show up right here, directly over the broadcast. However, you can't read the comments to the end. While you are looking for comments, I can add that in China, Mr. Director, personally had a cabin developed with his designers that attaches to the airship. They want to specifically and exclusively utilize only rigid structures, that is, a frame that is made of high-strength carbon fiber. All the instruments, as far as I understand, are aircraft instruments. There is nothing complicated about this. But due to a series of circumstances, I was also invited to institutes that work on artificial intelligence. And I realized that in China, the level is indeed already very high, where artificial intelligence is used extensively, especially in robotics and in various fields. I watched, they look like people, they move like people, they communicate already like people. And the use of unmanned airships, which are advanced and sophisticated with the help of cutting-edge artificial intelligence technology, is certainly great. This is the future of aviation and technological innovation. Yes, I just finished reading this comment, which was all about comparing our automotive industry with the Chinese one, looking at our Lada and their cars. And just recently, they were still living in tents. And what? Will you build your airships from? Most of it will be purchased in China. Yes, I understand this question. I used to think the same way before. Look, we started at the same time. In other words, in the 1990s, we experienced a restructuring, meaning that the Soviet Union collapsed into many states. And at that time, during the 20th century, China reached a dead end in history and they opened their borders they became open to the world. And at that very moment, a significant breakthrough occurred, which meant they had chosen the correct path for China. But unfortunately, that does not happen often. Those who understand how countries develop see that there are periods of growth, followed by declines, and then growth again. Yes, China is currently on the rise. There's nothing to worry about. I don't actually see this. Indeed, we were also on the rise in our time I remember the very first Debinar when you talked about Venus. Venus 1, Venus 2. Guys, what year was that? Was it 65 or 67? I think it was closer to 70, probably 75. Closer to 70, but then it was already 75. Well, what difference does it make? Look how many years ago that was. We flew into space, we flew to Venus, and we stayed on Venus for three days. No device in the world could do this, and still cannot. Just look, Elon Musk is flying in space right now, and they show that we have already gone through all of this. There was a time when we were at the height. Well, who is stopping us from going back to that height? I mean, let's start from a low launch and at least move forward in airship construction for sure. We were told that we are the engines of Dueno, that we would never build or create anything. Well, we did. Well, especially since China is asking for it now, right? 
They are asking for helium, but what else? They need nothing from us except brains, intelligence, and innovative ideas. At every meeting, please introduce us to your physicists and your mathematicians, as well as any other brilliant minds you may know. We are ready to pay them crazy money, offering salaries that are beyond their wildest dreams. Here, introduce them. We will persuade them ourselves. We will transport them ourselves. But of course, I won't take any of my acquaintances. I live in Ognensk, and I have a bunch of physicists and nuclear specialists as acquaintances. I won't introduce any of them to China because they will definitely lure them away. But the funniest thing is that the Chinese really reach out to many scientists with whom even we have communicated and our people simply say, I don't want to go to China. Let's do it here. Let's do it here. And many, you know, a lot of people are not patriots. They just don't want to bring it up there. It's a different country, a different mentality. Everything is different. There, production can be done. I won't argue, great and fast. But again, we definitely need to use this for our own purposes. By the way, I looked into Venus. It all started in 61 and ended in 85. Guys, the war ended in 45. By 61, projects for Venus had already started. They had already begun flying projects for Venus. The restructuring is all over, but this is our path. This is our development. History is cyclical. You are right. There is a rise and there is a fall. If we look at historical milestones, Russia is currently soaring upwards like a locomotive. Absolutely right. We have already taken off. Maybe. We have already lifted off from the surface. Yes. There was a joke like that. I don't want to say it, but for some reason, it gets mentioned. There was something like a report, like, look, our graphs are going up, everything is fine, and they explain in what order. When a cat falls from the ninth floor, it crashes down like this, and then it bounces a little. Are you talking to me about this bounce right now? <laughs> a funny joke, but it's not about us. Yes, that's right. We have certainly fallen hard, but one should never despair. Those who have never fallen have never risen either. Top. Yes. What I wanted to say is about China. What we will be purchasing there. What interests us. Well, everyone knows that our country is not in the top 20 players in electronics, right? That's right. Yes, they already made their chips. They have already moved away from American ones. But we also have something, but it all works for defense and it doesn't make sense for us. Of course, it exists for defense, but... Yes, it's clear regarding electronics. Materials are not necessarily required. We have a lot of our own now, and production is coming to Russia, and the Chinese are happily sharing their equipment for manufacturing and special fabrics with us. We recently attended an exhibition. This techno-textile event took place on the 3rd, 4th, and 5th at Crocus. We observed that composite materials are developing in our country. Mises is a truly wonderful university. You can check out what they are working on. Bauman University has a lot of departments. Yes, it is not fully industrialized everywhere, but there is a need for the task there. We have tasks. We have technologies. The team that can industrially implement this is available. All access to the equipment is available. But in fact, we are not so heavily dependent on external supplies. After all, we have. By the way, regarding computing technology and chips, there's China and so on. Yes, China. America holds all the patents there. China essentially manages all the production with Taiwan. Recently, we made a... Now, the processing of video content is underway. All of this video content exists. It is digital. It has a digital body. The digital body is fed into artificial intelligence. And he starts processing it there according to his own algorithms and outputs it. But there is a slightly different story. It is not digital, it is practically analog. It is quantum, it is optical. And we are starting to create computing systems based on a different principle. And it is quite likely that in just about five more years, we will see completely new technology that and so they made some kind of adapter that could process video in real time, meaning that the video stream was going 
and our totally quantum, well, quantum system was processing the video, recognizing certain symbols that were present in the video, much faster than doing artificial intelligence, which is currently digital through graphics card. Yes, and a revolution can really happen in an instant. And we will start using devices based on a completely different principle, becoming independent from anyone and even helping this market. Yes, but no one is stopping us. If we need any materials, no one is preventing us from procuring them there. As of today, there are no serious obstacles. Of course, there are attempts to do this, but so far there are no problems. Dmitry Sergeyevich Kamel is watching our webinar right now and points out that it was the balloons that flew to Venus in 1985. Two balloons transmitted data for 74 hours in 1985. They were launched from the interplanetary stations Vega. Thank you very much for such information. Yes. But the airships themselves flew even longer. The data simply stopped being transmitted because the batteries died. Well, here you go, guys. Here it is indeed, as promised. Guys, no one did this. There was such a powerful breakthrough during the Soviet era that no country can match it now. The fact that the Americans are flying somewhere today, right? But we have already gone through all of this and done it. Unfortunately, we have stopped. But I will repeat once again, this is our Russian path. And it is a better path. Sooner or later, we will still be ahead of everyone. Yes, by the way, here's something about space. What I remember is when Elon Musk first announced that he would be returning rocket stages. At that time I was working at the Krunichev State Research and Production Space Center and we were like returning the stages. We looked at our developments by Carl. The old by Carl's. We also had this one, which was energy based. The rocket that launched the Buran. Its side blocks would land back on parachutes. This was back then. They made by Carl's. This rocket takes off with Elon Musk and descends using the same engine. Our design was simpler. A wing rotated and it took off like an aircraft with stages flying away. All of this was done. I'll tell you more. There simply weren't any tasks for them. The designers were already doing this. Of course. Guys, I'll definitely tell you more. In kindergarten, you know, when I was a kid, I had a pump and a rocket. If you simply inflate this rocket with air, it would fly a short distance. But if you add water to it, it would fly much higher. We were already launching rockets into space when we were kids. By the way, it's very interesting where such a tradition comes from. You did this as a child and now Americans really love it. But for us, it seems like... It seems like we never had this... It was 50 years ago. I laughed. Maybe we are really 50 years ahead, we just don't understand something. <laughs> Everyone keeps telling us that we are behind, behind. Guys, I remember how far we've come. I'm already so old. How old are you? I don't remember. Well, that's right. So now I want to open vContact, but all those comments will disappear again. There was also a meeting not only with the director of the dirigible plant, but there were meetings with other enterprises, with investment companies, and there were meetings with Viktor Aristov, which was a very serious meeting. I will give a little advertisement. A video will be released soon. Very interesting projects are in the works. By the way, did you know that Viktor Aristov is working in China with Tupolev? He is a relative of our legendary Tupolev. They are also working on engines in the development of taxis and other vehicles, such as buses. Such taxis on wheels? Really, right? No, definitely. The taxis that fly... I thought Tupolev moved to China. <laughs> yes, taxi and such. Yes, I was just like that then. I was just asking these questions about the possibility of using engines in airship construction. Yes, of course, anything is possible. Yes, I can tell you again for those who didn't manage to watch. Here is Dmitry Sergeyevich Kamel, who is currently giving us insights about Venus. He was at the exhibition with this army that we had where Suvel Mash was present. He communicated with the specialists. He says that overall, at first glance, the engines are interesting and energy efficient in general. 
It is, of course, necessary to start a more detailed conversation with a clearer thesis. But, as they say, why not? Here you go. Our first project may just slightly overlap with the second one, and more. Of course, it definitely will. Of course it will. Here, Fyodor says, of course it will. Now I will also be more confident about this. So, YouTube is not opening for me. We are on Wi-Fi. If Pasha, Yulia, or anyone else is watching us, you can copy the questions and send them to me on Telegram so that I can see them. Right now there was an introduction showing footage from Kursach. In fact, we have started filming a whole series of videos, both experimental and informative, where we are familiarizing ourselves with gases and various other technological systems. And soon the filming will begin specifically for the stratospheric devices. What we were discussing back then in detail with Dmitry Sergeyevich Kamel during the webinar. Extremely interesting. The launches will be this month already. All details later. Is this what we are seeing right now at this very moment in time indeed? Yes, indeed. That's exactly what we were in Kyrzakh. Cool. Yes, by the way, after the trip to Kyrzakh. We also received a lot of calls and offers. They have a small boathouse there. Look, we have huge workshops from the old factory. 100, 200, 300 meters of free space. I think there are no tall buildings in our country. Recently, information has started to come in about buildings over 200 meters tall. And the sizes are like that. 45 meters wide, interesting. It turns out that such buildings were constructed in the country. They built and built. I've already talked a lot. Did you see when you drive the Wildberries warehouse with Eliazon? It's already a kilometer. How did they assemble it? Was it already assembled using the new technologies? He is short, obviously wide in area. Well, they definitely don't need such height. Yes. So, Andre, have you never flown on airships? So guys, I watched Pavel's presentation today and I saw his little circles. You can't imagine how really envious I was of him. Well, we have indeed talked a lot with the director who wants to engage in tourism. And this is how I just actually imagine it. Here is a ship in the water, right? And the air is the same substance, just more rarefied. And this airship, is indeed precisely a ship for travel. It is truly a ship for travel in the air. And when Pavel was sailing on this ship, with these beautiful blue lakes beneath him, it was fantastic. It was fantastic. I have absolutely never ever been on a dirigible or even a hot air balloon in my entire life. I remember when I first flew with my parents at the age of three, I got on a plane for the first time and shouted throughout the cabin. Mom, how are we going to descend? It's scary in an airplane. I understand that it's not scary at all in a dirigible. That's why I dream of it. Now it's my dream. Well, it is indeed quickly achievable. And I really want it to be ours. Not on a personal level, but on the one that we will build. Considering how difficult it is to obtain a visa to Germany right now, perhaps we can actually build a dirigible here faster. Guys, take a look at our slogan. Build a dirigible faster than getting a visa. Cool, right? It's quite an interesting slam. Yes, but everyone here should also understand that building a dirigible and getting it into the air is one thing, while ensuring that everything is certified, licensed, and so on, is quite another. The wind accidentally carried Germany away or wherever we need to go. I don't know. It just accidentally broke away around your Oblinsk and flew off. You'll have to talk about it yourself. Ha ha ha. Well, today we have a very cheerful meeting indeed. I learned a lot of new information from Fyodor today. It's great indeed. Yes, there are minimal technical questions today. 
There will definitely be a technical specialist at the next webinar on Friday. We will communicate in detail about the technology itself and the area that a person covers in this direction. It will be clearer to you how it works. We will give an announcement sometime at the very beginning of the week about what the topic will be so that you can prepare your questions thoroughly. Perhaps a video on this topic will come out soon in the near future. We'll see. Overall, the project is moving forward and first of all, you support it. You come, you watch, and we see the views. Our videos are gaining traction on YouTube. One of the videos already has 55,000 views. Wow. Class. I envy. On the new channel, there are 1,200 comments. And if you read them, they are all just in support. Everyone says it's cool, awesome, and definitely a must. Yes, indeed, we have daily registrations and we also have daily payments. People definitely support with money, not just with likes, and that's really cool. Today it's the Friday webinar. Everyone watching it has already supported us. The project is developing. Starting this month, all engineers will be hired into our company. We are almost at the logical conclusion of this process. And we will gather in one office to conduct a large webinar where you will all see how everything will be organized, who is responsible for what. We are gradually showing everything on Fridays and we will explain it all. Of course, there are still many questions regarding the ground. Today, here is one of those extremely important and fascinating news items. Guys, partners, remember, at the conference on the 7th, Sergei spoke. He said, yes, we are involved with flight schools. Today, Sergei sent a message. They finally received the certificate that their school is now fully officially licensed. This is not his first school, but it is the latest one that they have organized and created. This is a private school for pilot training. And he says, I am ready to create a methodology and teaching materials based on this school to train personnel for airships, pilots, and technicians. Here, regarding the question, will we catch up with China? Or do we not need to catch up with it at all? What Fedor is currently talking about now is still in the certification process. We already have it. Yes, and here Sergei sent these uh, scans, the pictures. He says, that's it. Sign up for the training. Awesome. Awesome. Here are some great news right off the bat. That's cool. Yes, there are also many proposals coming in for cooperation particularly regarding the placement of production facilities, meaning where to consolidate all these technological processes. And so we are still really choosing what kind of partnership there will be with the land, whether it will be a lease or a purchase. I think by next week we will sort everything out. We will finish this game and understand what is what. And what exactly is better specifically? It's better, of course to buy your own land. It belongs to you and you are the master of it. But for the project, it is ideal when there is already an existing aerograd, where all the necessary flight licenses are in place, there is a flight zone, and all agreements with the relevant administrations are established. Everyone knows that this is an aerograd. Seems it's time to start. Yes. And just to come up to them and say, guys, are you engaged in some kind of activity here? They say, yes, we are. Do you want airships to fly over your territory as well? We simply enter into a partnership. They let us into their company. And we bring them into our partnership. And no one pays anything to anyone, conditionally. For them, it is a point of attraction. It is investments and so on. It is also development. For them it's advertising, but for us it's an opportunity. In fact, it's just amazing what cool opportunities arise. If modern hangars start being built in your aerograd and airships are lifted into the sky, your aerograd suddenly becomes the center of attraction for everything. Both investments and tourism and attention from all sides. 
That is why there are so many proposals. Listen, it will work out, for sure. As I understand it, there are already many offers. Yes, quite a lot, actually. Today, more have arrived again. And we still think, well... We need to land. Yes. We need to choose something already. In fact, we are not in a hurry. We don't have any strict deadlines. If we don't make a choice in a month, everything will be lost. In fact, nothing will be lost. Neither our land, nor our offices will go anywhere. Usually, what is yours will eventually, ultimately come to you, no matter what. The main thing is that everyone feels comfortable, so there are no tensions during those moments. You know, when decisions are made in a rush and chaos, like, okay, we only have three options, let's take this one. That's a bad choice. It's a good choice when you have these three options. You have them there, I won't take them, they come to you anyway. You're like, no, it's not necessary, they come again. And you think, well, okay, let's think about it. So no fuss, they are not going anywhere, this is not some temporary solution, not a hasty decision made in a rush. And so yes, while we are still at the very beginning, we decided to take a closer look at these questions. To see what is actually happening. The longer we observe, the better the offers that appear. I remember how Dmitry Alexandrovich was choosing. It wasn't quick. The place where we were building, it was all very methodical. Yes, it was all done in a planned manner. Here we have... A bit simpler. Here it's definitely simpler. Yes, it's simpler with airships. There aren't that many of these aerocities. And the conditions are so different that the choice comes down to two or three. There's just a little bit left. There is a special economic zone. Many people ask why not in the special economic zone. There is a special economic zone in Ryazan. An aviation cluster has been created there. You can register a company as a legal entity to receive benefits such as limited liability, tax benefits, and more advantages to your business operations. Why not? But that's not the main point of this project. Because tax benefits and other preferences are good when, as you say, your margins are not that high. We produce engines, important, essential to have a tax year. It's very important. And then you have a good profit, just like you talked recently with a very cool person. He says that the profitability of non-state entities is such that... Yes, he said, we will pay as much in taxes as needed. There will still be a lot left. Again, this is when selling. The operations are completely different. Yes. An operating company can be registered in a special economic zone. Let's see. Tell me, can it be registered there, in some special economic zone, so that it can be there? Let's see. We have acquaintances who went to the Ryazan special economic zone. We communicate with them. The zone is quite young. We still need to figure things out. Look into it. There are not only advantages, but also disadvantages. So far, we see more positives. We are not rushing on these issues, but we are hurrying regarding the launches of devices into the stratosphere. Expect it this month for sure. Will the launch actually happen? Yes, it's not difficult. Launching the apparatus into the stratosphere is a hobby of those people who are involved in the implementation of the state project. It's really fantastic. When I told them in China that we can launch into the stratosphere, they were amazed. Well, these guys have lost it, and someone in China is also launching something. After all, something reached America, some kind of balloon that caused a lot of noise and commotion. Well, this is not the same option as when I was a boy, when we launched weather balloons. Weather balloons are the most basic option. It involves taking a latex weather balloon, filling it with hydrogen, attaching a parachute system to it, and adding some payload. He will ascend to the height where he will explode in four hours, and he descends with a parachute equipped with a beacon. This is a trivial thing that anyone can do. Yes, I remember. We used to look for those things that fell. This is not about such a speech. It is about controlled flights, long flights, and live broadcasting. It includes tracking through the Solar Group app, which shows the current location of the device. 
with the data obtained from it, this is no longer a toy like this weather balloon, but interesting launches are made with such uh, toys. They take not just one ball, but a whole bunch of these balls. There is a chair right below. You are in a spacesuit with a parachute. Just. I believe I saw a video like that somewhere around here. You going to jump? No, but I will. Will I? I will. I will definitely. First, it was a no. And now, if I dreamed of parachuting, I served in the aviation in the army. Did you jump? Well, they didn't miss it in terms of vision. I understand. I'm talking about how weather balloons can be such a trivial thing. Or it can be a complex special operation to launch a parachutist who will jump from the troposphere. And now, it seems that Konyukov wants to jump. I don't remember exactly, but it's for someone. The operation is currently being planned in our country. We will also film everything about this, show it, and tell who is involved. In general, it will be fun and interesting. That's it. What, have questions arrived for us? Yes, there is a little... Can you tell me if the amount of investment is satisfactory? Is it enough for everything? Yes, there are sufficiently enough investments and resources for the initial steps that need to be taken. The pace for starting the project is good. It is clear that for large-scale deployment, we need, well, with the same dynamics, if the monthly revenues in the form of installments continue to multiply, and these are the main revenues, then in a couple of months we will reach good rates. And that will be enough. In short, yes, is definitely enough. The new company is already registered. Thus, a legal entity brand Nova already exists and has been registered. The Nova brand itself, I just accidentally hinted at it, is going for registration. Please do not register it in advance so that we do not have to resell it later. So how many years does it actually take to train as a dirigible pilot? I know for sure that it is real. Yes, it seems like it will be mega cool. Our airport. Yes, you can really learn. I don't know how much. I can clarify or ask Sergei if he is currently watching our webinar to write in the chat, or I will ask him myself and write a little later. Most likely, it's easier to open Google and see how long it takes to train to be a private pilot. It's about the same amount of time. Well, I think it's about a year. Or even faster, most likely. Yes, and so what? We will all learn, definitely. And I will personally go through this training there. And Andre, I am sure. I am fully committed to studying. I will study diligently and passionately. I love to study. Yes, it is simply a necessity. If we have airships, the more pilots and knowledgeable people we have, the better it will be. Between Yekaterinburg and its suburb, armoring of the airport. Maybe it would be good to establish a base for airships there. Yes, the question is about the base. It won't be alone, that's for sure. We'll start from something. Here we are choosing starting positions to make it as efficient as possible, as inexpensive, fast, safe, and so on. But as soon as this initial MVP is created, the parent company will already be commercially successful, self-sustaining, with dividends and so on. From this moment on, we will build airship docks everywhere, because it is a necessity in every region. Recently, Vitaly from Altai also wrote in the chat that they really need airships there as they want to develop the tourism sector in their region. The flow of tourists has increased very significantly recently in the number of tourists. And they say that we need airships for tourism. We will design them in the Altai style and they will be municipal. I thought, what a multinational country we have. Can you imagine this huge machine is flying with all these national patterns on it? Yes. And when you go inside, there is definitely the style, local cuisine, and local music. That's absolutely mega cool. Yes. Then there will be an exhibition. 
of all Russian airships from all regions. How these balloon flights take place in Turkey. How beautiful it is. We have a chance to do the same with airships. The country is enormous. I believe that traveling across our country is really only possible by airship. Well, let's take the Platon Putaran, shall we? Who has been to the Platon Putaran? There were only a few people there. Previously, to get there by helicopter, you had to submit an application in St. Petersburg at the Institute. And then you could fly there by helicopter. My acquaintances flew in for 20 minutes. Someone there broke their leg and they were sent back immediately. Well, when you ask guys, what is this? They say, this is space. This is a place that no one else in the world has. There are waters, there are lakes and streams and ponds. There is a reserve. Well, there is no water reserve in the world like that on the Putarana Plateau, right? Those basalt cliffs, mountains. What should we fly there on? Can you imagine there are four to five airships circling this board? You won't be able to see how incredibly huge it is. And it's probably even bigger than France. And there are indeed a lot of such massive places in Russia. Well, and traveling on airships, I believe using airships for peaceful purposes is, of course, tourism. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Well, it's true that this chase for money indeed, of course, is undoubtedly all about commerce and such, but doing something for the soul, that's truly, for sure, absolutely. It moves faster this way. When I need to do something that I'm told to do, like when they say, Andre, you need to do this, I do it at one speed. But when they say it needs to be done and I want to do it, I do it four times faster. So right now, my heart is in this. I think this will happen quickly. And many people, when they see how we are moving forward, will join our ranks of dreamers, artists, the coolest designers in the world, physicists, and mathematicians. The company Dirigabli will gather all the best. So, here are some more questions that probably come from YouTube. Is it possible to launch satellites from a stratospheric airship? Yes, lightweight satellites can be launched from a stratospheric airship. It will serve as an intermediate platform. It will ascend there, release a light solid fuel rocket to send the satellite into space. It needs to be accelerated to a certain linear speed at a specific angle. Then it will reach a certain orbit. A rocket is still needed as a booster for the satellite, but it will take off from the stratosphere. And such technologies have already been developed, of course. And yes, it is possible to do this. If needed, the stratospheric airship itself is already a satellite. It can carry all the same equipment and perform the same tasks. Yes, but if it specifically needs to be orbital, then the answer is yes, it can be done. This is my first time hearing about airships. How are flight permissions handled? Is it problematic? What is the total percentage allocated? Are there any calculations? If we take a prepared aerograd, whether with a flight field or an experimental flight field, all the permissions are already in place, and it's just a matter of coordinating with the nearest control tower, almost our own, to let them know that we are taking off, and off we go. No permits are needed for this. If we take new agricultural land and convert it, for its proper use, that's where all these permits start. It's a long, expensive and painful process. And then a tangible value emerges for all these operations. Therefore, we are specifically looking for land that is already ready for flights. There is a lot of it. This is exactly the money we will save. And time. Are there any calculations? Yes. We will definitely try to avoid them and wonder why we should even see and show them. For now, there is absolutely no point. If hydrogen is safe in the upper layers of the atmosphere, then a balloon can be launched with it and later, adding gondolas to a helium airship converts it to a hydrogen one. Yes, it's possible. This way, I suppose it can work, right? An interesting idea.
I don't know how technically feasible it is. Of course, everything needs to be calculated, analyzed, and so on. And that's correct. There is a logical reasoning behind it. The fact that hydrogen, even when it rises into the stratosphere, starts from the Earth, and there is oxygen here, so it is still dangerous. That's why you launch it unmanned from here. It flew away. You fly behind him on helium, and at some point in time you switch over to him. Complex combination. Yes. It would be easier to just lift off with helium and fly. As I say, we live in an amazing age. We have people flying on the ISS, rovers exploring planets, and Elon Musk plans to colonize Mars. So from an engineering and technical standpoint, we can achieve everything. If it is feasible, and any goals can be chosen, and everything can be done accordingly, then yes, indeed anything is possible. So, why exactly does the airship need such huge tail wings? I don't know that... For beauty. No, not for beauty, but for manageability. But, this is still calculated. It's not just like that. There is definitely a certain speed of the airship, and there is an airflow washing around it, it has its own mass, centers, force applications, and so on. And if you redirect part of a certain flow, then a force appears in a specific place, and the device is controlled correctly there. And so, having roughly calculated what part of the airflow needs to be redirected for the entire structure, the power system, to turn somewhere, this area was obtained. It simply turned out that way because it was calculated. That's why they are so large. And there are several of them. The wings are responsible for many things, including turns and yawing. They carry many various functions. We can discuss this separately later with those people who are specifically involved in the specific field of flight dynamics calculations, so that they explain what the tail assembly does it is split into upper and lower parts. The tail is cut into two like this. Steering wheels, wings and more such as these will tell the story. Good, by the way, we need to call in the dynamicists and the calculators. Let them explain why it is so huge. I never thought that such inquiries could indeed arise. The inquiries are very technical. People are interested. Yes. You might have been to China, you just didn't see it. We had several technical webinars where there were certification specialists. I am just amazed. Nowhere in the world when a project is launched does everything go with such hype. Such technical details are only interesting to Russians. It's the specificity of our mindset. When we do something, we need to dig down to the very core. How do these molecules move in helium? Probably such questions will arise as well. When they want to mix it with hydrogen, it is necessary to understand how everything will move there. Yes, there were probably questions. In fact, we have a country that doesn't talk much about this. It is still an aerospace power. There is no other way to describe it. We have a helicopter state, a space power, and everything was great with airplanes before. And with fighters, overall, things are not too bad now. We built our airships. They existed in the Russian Empire, in the Soviet Union, and in modern Russia. And they will continue to exist because we are building them. And we have a lot of engineers trained in all aviation fields, topics, and so on, and expertise. In short, we are a country focused on the sky. Megaminds. Despite the fact that many have left, I see that there are still a lot of intelligent people remaining with us to uplift, to start. Yes, and the younger generation is definitely encouraging now. There is indeed a younger brother. I looked at what they think, how they communicate, and where they aim. They are very level-headed. They like science. Look at all these medalists, mathematicians, chemists, physicists. These are Russian schoolchildren, chess players. 
as you rightly noted, the country experiences downturns and upturns, and one can... The potential is immense. Yes, I would definitely mention that we are on the rise right now. So what shall we chat right now? Wow, we really chatted. We definitely had a conversation. They told us yes. Tell me, what are the further plans regarding China with the director? Is he expecting something from us? Guys, yes, the director is waiting for our response regarding the collaboration response. First of all, they need money. They are asking for money. They are asking for mathematicians. They are asking for physicists. As I understand it, I believe even when they successfully pass certification, they do not have the designers and expertise and people like we do. They want to acquire them. And this issue was raised at all meetings, the issue of people, the issue of brains, as we might call it, at all meetings, at the highest level and with government officials. Everywhere in each and every province, they have their own local government which is extremely zealous and enthusiastic and willing to sponsor and provide support and assistance, but only if there are credentials. I don't know if I'm really telling this for a good reason, because maybe, perhaps there will be a brain drain. What do you think? I don't think so. It won't happen. Why? Everything is turning out just perfectly for us. The engineers and airship pilots were naturally starting to have ideas about relocating somewhere in order to implement their developments, concepts, and dreams. But we started the project and they are very glad and happy that this movement has begun in Russia. I think now even abroad they will be drawn to us when they see our dynamics. We will attract their brains. That's great. Of course. It's time to start thinking for ourselves. Well, I don't even know what kind of assistance will be provided to our current friends in China. I can't even speculate. Well, that's not really my question anymore. I've objectively shared everything. There are many recordings, a lot of material, and numerous meetings. But I don't know how we will behave in any way or manner with the company that will be producing airships in China. But the fact that we are some kind of partners is certain. We touch upon the same topics. Colleagues in ballooning, at the very least. At least, at least, at least, at least. Yes, friends, we need to wrap up the webinar. Once again, we have almost reached two o'clock. But today we didn't go over it. That's already wonderful. Today is Friday. Surely many simply want to relax, exhale and go and rest. The only thing I wanted to ask you to do a bit more is to like share and choose the best video or the best news. Send it to a friend, girlfriend, mom or dad. Just share this information. It is very important for us that it spreads. After all, this is a people's project funded by the people. Send out the referral link from your account. Very important. I like the story of Sergei Semyonov. In previous projects, he realized for the first time what the power of just one repost is. I posted my referral link and project desk on my wall on vContactor. And with just one click, someone familiar to him built such an incredible structure that greatly helped the project. In other words, he simply informed his acquaintance that there is a project and she got involved. He did not expect that this could happen. He built such a structure, attracted so much investment, and the project moved forward. So we shouldn't underestimate this one simple action. Please, help. It's very important. All right, guys. Overall, what cool. Pashka flew on a dirigible together with Ivan and Zil. I envy Palu, I envy Zilio. Andrei has returned from China, while we are here in Russia digging into the ground, so we are moving forward together with you. Expect some exciting news. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you all, my dear friends and colleagues. Great.